Uh, sorry, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> I am a Drupal Core CSS maintainer and more, and new to me, I am a Starshot Advisory Council member. Yeah, it's exciting. So I work for Agilina. Um, Agilina is awesome. We work, we do Drupal for federal agencies. Like that is our niche. That is what we do. We're good at it. Uh, we work with a lot of big federal agencies. And if any of you want to work with us or think we might be a good fit, come talk to me. I'd love to hear you. I'm going to talk to you. So I want to, I want this room to be, I want this room to uh, kind of be loud here. I want to get a feed, some feedback on what are Drupal strengths. Just yell them out. Come on, somebody. Accessibility. Accessibility. Multilingual. Information architecture. Information architecture. API first. API first. Configuration Config. Yeah. Security. All, all those are awesome, right? So, um, like, in my mind, it comes down to all of those. It comes down to things like structured content and the ability to configure that structured content through the UI. Uh, our robust APIs are like way better than a lot of our competitors. Things like the render API, which I love and kind of hate sometimes. <laughs> um, what are Drupal's weaknesses? Learning curve. Yeah. Learning curve. Anything else? Sure. All right. Learning technologies. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would say the learning curve is a big deal. Um, our, to, to learn how to use Drupal, to set it up properly, it takes a lot of experience, and a lot of times that experience is like building crappy sites so you finally figure out how to do good sites. <laughs> you know, um, I would I would also argue like I'm a I'm a front end developer here, and like the front end of Drupal takes a lot of specialized skill. You know, and and I I, I think that has a high learning curve, a higher learning curve than it than it should be. So uh, several years ago, Acquia commissioned a study. And the study kind of found that the more people use Drupal, the more people learn Drupal, the more they like Drupal. And that is different than a lot of other content management systems, where the other content management systems, the more they use it, the more they learn to hate it. You know? and, um, but still, Drupal is starting from a disadvantage here. We're starting at a very low point. And this is hurting Drupal's market share. Drupal's market share is, is, is falling. And which is a shame because we have an amazing product. We have a product that like kicks the ass out of almost all of our competitors in various different ways. Um, and we've been working on this learning curve for so long, it, but they're all very small incremental steps. You know, this is. I remember there was even going between Drupal six and Drupal seven. There was like D seven UX initiative and stuff like that. This has been happening for a while, but we're not there. Um, so starting like maybe a year ago or so, several of the Drupal leadership team, product managers and people like that, got together and started doing a little bit of introspective. And like, why are we not there? What is preventing us from getting there? And if you think about this, so when you create a Drupal site, you have to install a number of different modules. Like off the top of my head, you think of things like Path Auto and MetaTag that are on 99.9% .9 of websites out there. But if you're a newbie coming into Drupal, you don't know this. You don't, you're, you're trying to figure out how do I make my URLs? How do I put words in my URLs? How do I do this? And it's very, very difficult. Um, it takes a lot of experience to pick some good modules. You know, you have to, you have to evaluate the usage of the module. You have to see if it supports the version that you support it. And then you have to install it. Right now, when you install a module, you have to open up the command line. You have to use Composer. Uh, back when I started in Drupal 5, it was nice. You just download a zip file, you know, or, or tarball or whatever it was back then. Um, and then to customize the experience, you have to hire someone like me. Like if I have a design and I want to, I want to make that look the way I want. I, I, I want Drupal to match this design. You have to hire a, front, a Drupal front end developer, and I charge a lot of money. Like that, it costs money, and that raises the total cost of ownership for Drupal. On top of that, it takes a lot to get stuff into Drupal Core. Drupal Core is relatively slow to move, and that's a problem. Drupal Core is robust. It's amazing kind of because it's slow. So there's like a give and take on that. So Drupal Starshot is 
Starshot is a key word. This is not going to be a product name. After Starshot is done, you're not going to hear that word anymore. Um, Starshot represents two strategic shifts. It's going to empower content creators, marketers, web managers, designers, basically non-developers to build your website, to build a Drupal site independently. Don't rely on developer. And like that's a little scary as a developer, but and, and, and it also kind of blows my mind. How are you going to do this? Um, through this way, we want to extend Drupal's presence in the mid-market, you know? Like, with Drupal 8 onwards, we had this focus on enterprise. We had this focus on, like, large government institutions, educational uh, sites, large, large organizations, and Drupal does well with this. But the only reason that Drupal is not not good for smaller organizations is because we have the higher learning curve. Now, like as a developer, we're, we're, Drupal is still going to need the heck out of developers. You know, developers are important, but the Starshot initiative prioritizes the non-developer. Drupal Core is got, has its own product strategy that is more developer uh, focused. I believe that Starshot's going to be the biggest change in Drupal since we uh, rewrote uh, Drupal and Symphony, which happened between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. It's going to be a big deal, but it's not nearly as scary. You're not going to have that upgrade process that we're all still going through. Um, the focus areas in Drupal, Starshot, are kind of like everything. You know, everything from installation, configuration, visual customization, and then deploying your site. How can you? How can a non-developer do this? Um, it's gonna. It's gonna be interesting. Um, so, like, what is in Drupal Starshot? You know, we talked about the priorities of Drupal Starshot, but like, what's going into it? You know, um, and I want to give like a little warning here. This is like kind of a fire hose of information. Um, some of it's slightly technical. Most of it's non-technical. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's get into it. So Drupal, Drupal has always kind of threaded this line between a framework and a content management system. I've been on projects where we use Dreamwork, or Drupal purely as a framework where we don't even have nodes before and we're just using the front end. I've been on projects where it's more a, a content management system. I think that's like really Drupal strength. Uh, Drupal is creating a kind of a new product called Drupal CMS. And so this is kind of a wireframe that was developed for for Drupal.org, and and this is this is kind of what it's going to look like when you have someone new going to download and evaluate Drupal. Um, Drupal Core is going to be to the right. It's going to be evaluate. It's going to be marketed as a framework for developers. Drupal CMS is going to be marketed to people who are not necessarily developers who are coming into it. It's going to be like it's going to be the easy button for Drupal. Um, Drupal CMS is going to integrate, it, it's going to have by default a lot of these common modules that we love and we use, maybe even some of th that you should be using that you don't know about. So like obviously things like Path Auto and, um, and Meta Tag are like easy, easy to include there, but there might be, like we're talking about including the Jin administration theme, which is like, it makes Drupal's back end even more beautiful than it currently is. Um, talking about things like type tray, which uh, like will kind of organize your con if you have a lot of content types, it'll organize your content types into different categories and stuff like that, which is like super super useful. Um, when you install Drupal CMS, you're going to have installation options. Um, so like right now, if, if you all know this, you install Drupal, it asks you developer questions like you know what is your database credentials. You know, what do you want your site name to be? Do you want automatic updates on this stuff? So Drupal CMS, I'm assuming, is still going to have some of that stuff, but it's going to give you some more options right here. It's going to ask you, like, hey, are you a corporate site? Are you a magazine? Are you a, I don't know, something else? These, of course, are still mock-ups. All, all this is kind of, kind of in, uh, being decided right now, and I have some surveys at the end that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show to you that hopefully you can help make these, these decisions. Um, we're also going to be able to install features, so it's not just to like the look and feel during the installation process, but it's going to be like, do I want the capability to create events, a calendar system, do I want forms, you know? And so when you install it, it's going to give you the option to 
Like, I don't know, like, you don't have to know what Webform is because Webform would be automatically included. Um, and when you're done installing, it'll dump you on a dashboard. And the dashboard will help you finish the site. It'll help you configure everything that might not be configured during the installation process. These are things that other content management systems do well. Like, I don't know if anyone has ever used like things like Wix, Squarespace, or anything like that. Um, they, they do this. And it helps onboard these new users. This is what we need to grow our community and grow Drupal's market share. Um, Dries announced this initiative at DrupalCon Portland, which was, I don't know, in May or something like that. The goal for the first version of Drupal CMS is by the end of the year. We want this out by, by early January. Um, it is not going to be the final version of it. Drupal CMS is going to iterate rapidly. Drupal Core currently releases a new version every, like a new uh, minor version every six months. Drupal CMS is not going to be on that schedule. It's going to, it's going to go quicker. Uh, as we add things in there, as we, as we work on this, it is going to, it is going to, we're going to add things to this. Um, within Drupal Starshot, there's kind of uh, four main new modules features in there. Automatic updates, project browser, recipes, and experience builder. And I'm going to touch on each of these individual. But one of the things I also want to talk about with Drupal CMS is like when you, when you, when you download Drupal CMS, it gives you all these options. But when, if you're upgrading Drupal, you're upgrading Drupal like normal. You just have those, you have that configuration, you have those modules, but you upgrade that stuff as you would expect. Um, Drupal, Drupal Core is getting a new module called Automatic Updates. Automatic Updates does um, like what you think it does. It does automatic updates, right? But it's cooler than that, you know? So other content management systems have had automatic updates for a long time. Like, it, like if you go to one of these hosted solutions, you don't have to worry about upgrades. That's, the, that's one of these benefits of using something like Contentful, Webflow, or something like that. Um, we need to compete with these. Uh, automatic updates is awesome. It, um, so it does a couple like really, really cool things. Like number one, it'll create a staging copy of your site and it'll verify that it works. And then once it verifies it works, it'll move it to the live, it'll apply those updates to the live part of the site. So it gives you a certain amount of confidence that these updates are not breaking your site. It also, uh, it, it also is very secure. It's, it's using a framework called the Update Framework, which is a cryptographic framework that does code signing. So the code is signed by Drupal.org servers and will be verified by, by your local Drupal installation. It's going to be a lot more secure than like competing solutions that WordPress or other content management systems have. Automatic updates is not going to be enabled by default in Drupal Core. So if you're a large organization and you do not want automatic updates, you do not have to have them. But there are APIs to integrate them into, into your workflow. So like you could have lower environments, do your up, updates, trigger Git, uh, Git workflows, integrate into your CI process, build something, run your tests on that, and do automatic deploys. There's ways to get this working that can relieve a lot of pressure from your developers and lower your total cost of ownership. Um, the UI for automatic updates is kind of what you expect. There's nothing like crazy here. It's like, I want to update something, I hit a button to update it. Updates will be uh, able to run by buttons, it will be, or you can run it unattended. There's, there's going to be different options. It's going to be kind of do what you want right here. Um, Similar to automatic update is Project Browser. So I like to think of Project Browser as a user interface for Composer. Uh, Composer, for those who are not developers, are, is just basically the way that you pull down all your extensions for Drupal and those might have more dependencies and stuff like that. So this handles it kind of out of the box. And it also gives you the ability to discover and find new modules. Has anyone like ever gone to Drupal.org and like looked at the module discovery search screen? It looks like it was like created in 2010 because it probably was. And uh, like it's difficult to find stuff, and it's 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 polluted with like Drupal 7 stuff all over. And when you're like really looking for Drupal 10, you know, 
and it's, it's a little bit confusing. Um, there's a lot of UX work going into Project Browser. Project Browser is going to have all the modules and themes and recipes, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, integrated into this. You can filter it. It's going to be very dynamic. Um, so uh, it'll allow you to pull down your, it'll pull down, install your projects, but it uses Composer behind the scenes to do it. So for example, you can pull down a uh, project using Project Browser and then update it using Composer, or you can pull down a project using Composer and then update it using automatic updates. All of this is going to work together. Um, recipes are one of the things that I'm most excited about. They're kind of the glue that's going to hold this Drupal CMS together. Um, I like to view recipes as a successor to installation profiles, but installation profiles aren't going anywhere because we have a lot, a lot of backwards, like there's a lot of installation profiles that exist that we can't just throw away. Has anyone ever like used an installation profile, something like Open Atrium or, yeah, Open Atrium, Acquia, Lightning, there's, there's, there's hundreds of them out there. Has anyone ever tried to like upgrade them? And has everyone like ever like stabbed their eye with a pencil <laughs> while doing that? Uh, like it's 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 a little bit painful at the same time. So installation profiles will put their dependencies into their own directory, which is hard to upgrade. Sometimes you try to upgrade it, and it breaks other things because installation profiles can have uh, their own code that depends on a certain version of the module, and things can get ugly very fast. Recipes are, do not have this lock-in. Uh, recipes are pieces of functionality. They can have dependencies on modules, themes, other recipes. Uh, the same functionality can be achieved by site building. So you could have a recipe, that, like your recipe is basically the same thing that you, that you can get by number one, like pulling down all your modules and themes that you want in this and then clicking around and then adding content. Um, Recipes are easy to share. They don't lock your site in. Uh, you can have default content with it. Um, right now, recipes are applied with the script, but they're being integrated in with Project Browser. One of the things that, like a, a way that I like to describe recipes is like, like let's say I want to make, a, a, let's say I'm a small customer. I'm, I'm obviously not, I'm not government, and I want to create a restaurant. I want to create a restaurant website. I can download a recipe for a restaurant website, which might have other other dependencies on, like, say, like uh, a menu recipe or a contact, you know. And it'll pull all this down. It'll pull down a theme. It'll pull down some default content. And at the end of it, you'll have a full-on site that you can start tweaking. You know, it's pretty powerful. There are certain things that recipes explicitly cannot do and should not do. Uh, recipes don't contain their own code, and this is awesome because you do not upgrade the recipe, you apply the recipe. If you pull down a module via a recipe, you upgrade that module the way we currently upgrade that module, or through automatic updates. Um, you do not update to later versions of the recipe. Once you have a recipe, it's applied, you have that. And you, it do, recipes don't delete anything. So recipes are actually included in Drupal 10.3. This is an initial version of the API. And um, like, uh, so at Agilina, we're currently using recipes. We're, we're working on a US federal court system, which is a, obviously a very large project. And we need to, we need to push um, configuration and content down to 300 odd websites. Recipes is a perfect solution for this and it's working very well for us. So uh, Martin, over here, he has a session in this room at two o'clock. And uh, if you don't know Martin, this is what he looks like. <laughs> this is how he looks cool. <laughs> I got one more. And I hear it on good authority, it's your birthday. <laughs> so uh, at two o'clock, if you're interested in recipes, uh, uh, come see him. Um, the thing that I am most excited about is Experience Builder. So it has, so a show of hands here, has, who uses Layout Builder? I'm seeing like maybe like a quarter of the room. Who uses uh, Paragraphs to manage sites? Another quarter of the room. Who uses, um, 
So who uses like Gutenberg or something? Uh, Acquia does a good amount, or not Acquia, Agilina does a good amount out of Gutenberg. We do that. Um, any other solutions? Display suite. Display suite? Yeah. Site Studio. Site Studio. Yeah. So uh, experience built, like all of, the, all of those solutions kind of have their own problems, and, I, and you probably have all run into this. So um, there has been a lot of research going into Experience Builder before, before code has even started to be written. Um, they're like Drupal, Drupal product managers have evaluated other solutions internal to Drupal, like all those that you mentioned. We've evaluated uh, things like uh, Wix, Squarespace, of course, Gutenberg, uh, Webflow, Contentful, all these site building stuff. Because we want Experience Builder not to just match what they're doing, but we want it to like totally curb stomp them. We want, we want Experience Builder to be the best page builder on the web today. Um, there's a, as I said, there's a lot of work currently going into this. There, uh, this is a mock-up from Figma right here that kind of just gives you the general idea of the direction of this. So you can kind of see there's a flyout. The front end of, of the Experience Builder is built using React, but the components are rendering using Drupal standard rendering process and Twig. Um, if you go to the Experience Builder uh, project page, uh, there's a there's this big old spreadsheet listed at the bottom that has a, like 70 something user stories and it, and it, it tells you exactly what experience builder needs to do in the prior, priority of each story. So some of the features that are going to be useful to to the the content team are like things like you would expect like drag and drop placing, reordering, uh, default sets of layouts, reusable patterns being able to edit the fields live, design system integration, uh, real-time previews, uh, nesting of components, the ability to create new components, um, hierarchical tree where you can drag stuff around, and the ability to place global components. And that includes like things into the headers, into the footers, if that's enabled. Which is like, to me, it's a little scary, it's a little, it's, it's interesting, and, and, and it's kind of blowing my mind that this is possible. Um, we're working very, very hard on accessibility. There's a Drupal core accessibility maintainer working as a tech lead in this. Uh, it's, gonna, it's, it's going to meet ATAG 2.0. ATAG, if you're not familiar with it, is the authoring tool accessibility guidelines. It's like WCAG, but for like the ability to create new, new pages and authoring, like author new sites or new content. Um, if you download it right now, it's not even close to accessible. So, uh, but that's that is coming. Um, one of the things, like as a developer, that I'm super excited about is is there's a lot of developer-friendly work going into this. Like, so as as uh, experience as page builders were being uh, evaluated, there was a lot of talk about even potentially building external. Uh, integrating external uh, page builders into Drupal. So there were serious discussions about integrating Drupal as the default, or not Drupal, uh, things like Gutenberg as the default experience into Drupal. Like this was something that was seriously discussed. We were looking at other solutions too. Um, we, it was decided against that for a number of different reasons. Um, so experience builder is going to be very developer friendly so if you're not familiar with Gutenberg you have to have like multiple templates one for the editorial view and one for um, one for the front end uh, you're not going to need that with experience builder you're going to have it's going to work well with things like view modes it's going to have the ability to place uh, fields from reference entities which is going to be super useful and of course like structured data it's going to work with both unstructured and structured data together um, it's going to work with decoupled sites by outputting data to JSON API. It, it has a heavy and has heavy integration with single directory components. Um, ha you have the ability to limit design token options. So, like right now, like if I like right now on the project I am on, I have to limit the colors that editor the editorial team can choose when they change the color, the background color of their button, so they don't create pink buttons. We, like, you're going to be able to easily do this using Experience Builder. 
Uh, it works with Drupal's configuration system. It, uh, it works with uh, blocks and fields. The blocks and fields that are exposed to Experience Builder are explicitly exposed. So like if, if you're familiar with like Layout Builder, Layout Builder just kind of dumps everything to you that you, don't, that you don't want. And you have to explicitly hide those. And there's modules that help you with that. Uh, it's not going to work that way with Experience Builder. It's going to work out of the box. Um, and something that, like, so as I was researching a lot of this, I, I ended up talking to Ben Mullins, who's, who's on the team developing this. Um, and, and he was, like, super excited about this last part. So the, uh, like, the, the editorial interface of Experience Builder is built using React, TypeScript, and a bunch of cool technologies. Um, but all the forms within that are totally customizable using Drupal's form API and, and hooks and stuff like that. It works with our form system. So that's like something as a developer you're not going to need to go in and write React code to modify your forms, which is super, super cool. It's gonna, there's going to be tools to migrate from all the common, common solutions, things like Layout Builder, Paragraphs, and Site Studio and stuff like that. Um, the goal of it is to be the best of everything, the best in the web, to build Experience Builder. Um, it's, it's super exciting, in my opinion. It's something that Drupal has needed for a long time. Like WordPress has been eating our lunch at these lower to mid-market uh, sites, and our goal is to, is to get back in there and kind of take that back from them. So as you think of all these new things that are going in there, I want you to think of what we talked about Drupal strengths. None of what we talked about fly in the face of Drupal strengths. Drupal, Drupal strengths, like our robust APIs and our, our structured content, our security, our, our accessibility is gonna continue to just be top notch. We are going to, the goal of this is to lower the total cost of ownership so we can increase our market share, so we can bring more developers into the community, so we can, we can make the web better. So, the, like, we also, so there's a lot of moving parts in this. There's a whole bunch of moving parts. Like, Acquia has, like, something like 10 to 20 full-time employees working on this. Uh, there's a lot of other organizations who have full-time employees working on this. And the question is like, well, how do we organize this? Um, the principles that we have, we need, we need to be fast and efficient. We need to prioritize the personas and the goals. And we need to be open when we do this. And so the way that we're doing this is we have a Starshot leader leadership team that's led by Dries. And so this team uh, communicates very regularly with the track leads, and I'll talk about that. Uh, we also have a monthly Starshot Council, which includes me, where we, we ask questions, we get in there, we, we try to poke holes in, in things, and we, we communicate and try to, uh, try to make sure we're nudging this in the correct way. Um, and there, we have this concept of tracks. Tracks, I, I think track might be the wrong word. I, I like, to, I like the kind of the JIRA uh, concept of epics. Like, it's, these are the ideas to, these are like the individual things that need to get done. And they could be like things like create an event recipe, create, th that might go into the uh, installation uh, process or something like that. And there's a lot of these. And we're still taking uh, uh, applications for uh, volunteers for these. So you're thinking to yourself, you know, I, the website that I manage is for a large government agency or a large enterprise. I, you know, I have a million dollar website. I don't have a hundred thousand dollar website. So, like, why do I care about this? Um, recipes are going to affect everybody. So, recipe, recipes are something that the largest organizations can use by bundling up configuration, using it on multiple different sites. Um, Automatic updates can run on your test environments and automatically commit. You can run tests against them. That can simplify your developers, uh, your developers' workflows. Um, project browser. You can configure project browser to not reach out to Drupal.org, but to reach, but to limit the list of uh, modules and recipes and themes that the site managers can actually install. So, an example of that is if you're running a large university, you have a couple hundred websites. 
you can say like, all right, I have this custom module right here that it might be like, I don't know, a, a directory of faculty or something like that. And you can, you can choose to install this or you can choose not to install it and it will just work. Um, Experience Builder is going to be awesome for your content editors. They're going to be able to create new, more engaging websites or uh, pages on your website without people like me having to get in there and write custom HTML and CSS, which is pretty common. Um, and by reopening this mid market for Drupal, we're going to grow the community. You know, a rising tide floats all ships. By reopening by having smaller organizations move to Drupal, you're going to have this whole new, new lifeblood of developers coming in, reaching up to leadership positions and, and growing our community. And that's awesome. You know, like, I'm excited about this. So to get involved today, the easiest thing to do is just go to Drupal, drupal.org slash starshot. There's a lot of stuff in there. And um, there's things like, there's a lot of uh, Zoom sessions that are recorded, uh, issues, it'll point you to issues that you can help out on, and it'll also point you to individual uh, Drupal Slack channels where you can help out on the initiatives that you're interested in. Uh, there's a couple surveys here. I have, I have two surveys for you. One of them uh, I, would, I would like you to par participate for is more for developers. So if, if you're a developer and you, you're thinking to yourself, I want what go what should go into Drupal CMS? This is this survey right here. You know, you can say like I want my favorite module. You know, like I don't know. I I, I do the uh, quick link module that could go in there. You know, I don't think it should, but it could. You know, um, if you're a marketer, um, I would like you to take the SEO survey, and the SEO survey will ask you questions like. Uh, what do you need? <laughs> like, what should be built out of the box? SEO is important for a lot of websites, and we want to make sure we get this right. Um, I have a little bit of housekeeping here. I have a lot of thank yous. I want to. I want to thank, of course, my company Agilina, who is awesome. This slide deck was created by Lori and Geber. Um, I got a lot of fact checking. Like, I I, I got uh, Christina Tremias and Ben Mullins on uh, some calls and said, like, hey. Am I lying to people? And like I said, yeah, totally. Um, and of course, the Drupal GovCon organizers for being awesome. And I want to thank all of the GovCon sponsors for being awesome because this couldn't happen without them. And I want to invite you all to Florida Drupal Camp, which is the best Drupal Camp in the whole world. And it is, thank you. It is, in, uh, it is in Orlando in February. And if you have not been to Orlando in February, the weather is always perfect. It's, it's way nicer than up here. And uh, I have about 10 minutes for questions. And I, there's a lot more that I didn't cover. So if you have questions, uh, please stand up. And I will repeat the questions so the recording can capture it. Uh, go ahead, James. Would you mind going back to the SEO uh, thing I missed? Sure. This is the SEO uh, survey. Uh, any other questions as you're here? Do you expect stuff from Starshot to be fed back into Core? Yeah, do we expect stuff from Starshot to be fed back into Core? And the answer is yes. So uh, I had this conversation. So um, both Project Browser and Automatic Updates are going directly into Core. Th those have been uh, around, those initiatives have been around for a little while. Those will go directly into Core. I asked Ben if he expects Experience Builder to go into core. He said, he phrased it as, it's a nice to have. So Experience Builder comes with a lot of dependencies. It's built using modern technologies. It's built using things like TypeScript, um, you know, React. And so it has a lot, of, a lot of those no NPM dependencies. Each one of those dependencies, as a process to get into core, will need to be individually evaluated. So that's going to be a holdup of getting that into core but it will be part of Drupal CMS, and it's also its own project that you can pull down if, you're, you, if you have Drupal right now, you'll be able to pull that down and you'll be able to migrate your content to it and start using it. Uh, in the back. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that you uh, start shift with like CMS, um, like learning curve and stuff, and um, kind of the negative, you mentioned like WordPress. Uh, do you guys ever um, collaborate with 
collaborators there? And also, um, is there any talks about like e-commerce on Drupal, like you can read that and stuff? Yeah, so uh, the question is, 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 is there been, ever been any like, cross-pollination between like things like WordPress and Drupal? And then a uh, follow-up question on that was like, is there any talk to do any type of work on e-commerce, uh, additional work on e-commerce in Drupal? So to the first part is, there's, there's been some work, uh, some cross-pollination between, on Gutenberg, excuse me, between uh, Drupal and WordPress. Like, if you don't know, Drupal does have a Gutenberg integration. And uh, a couple of years ago, maybe last year, uh, the uh, folks from Automatic, which is like the primary um, primary WordPress company, I think, and then a Drupal company, I think Frontcom, who does like a lot of the Gutenberg stuff over in Europe, got together and they uh, they did a little bit of collaboration to bring to potentially bring Gutenberg into Drupal or to make that integration better. Like obviously, we're not bringing Drupal into or Gutenberg into Drupal, like, but that was researched heavily at the time. Um, beyond that, I don't know if there's if if there's much collaboration. Uh, to your second point about e-commerce, um, like Drupal Commerce is is the is the general solution for uh, for for commerce in Drupal, right? Uh, Drupal Commerce has, in, in my opinion, has been like really kind of kind of kind of pointing itself toward the enterprise. You know, Centaro, which is the mod which is the company behind that, targets that enterprise. Um, I don't know if they're going to be releasing recipes. It seems to me like that would be almost like a slam dunk for them to do so. So I would assume they were, but I haven't had any conversations with Ryan or anyone that works at uh, Centaro about that. Go ahead. To add on, the automatic updates initiative was meant for collaboration with the wider PHP community yeah. PHP uh, the update framework. Yeah. So that was intended for the entire PHP community to have and utilize for secure automatic. That's a good point. Thank you, Matthew. So uh, Matthew adds on, uh, I'm just repeating this for the recording. Uh, uh, Matthew adds on that the update framework that's included in automatic, the automatic updates is like written as a generic PHP library that can be used across multiple PHP projects. Uh, behind? You? Yeah. Okay. Um, so a long time ago, we started uh, adding modules to core that we thought that were really useful. Right? Yeah. And at some point, we decided we were just too low and we started moving those, right? And now it feels like we've come full circle, right? To, like, Figuring out which modules are good to add to the version of the core. Um, how are you guys trying to figure out that we don't fall into the same mistakes that we did before by having a starter version of the Drupal that is just too loaded and too unnecessary? Yeah. All right, so the question is. Um, so a long time ago, like there's been a lot of discussion between small core and big core, you know, like so a lot of time, like before we added a lot of modules into core, then we started making modules out of core, right? So like uh, things le like things like the pull module or the uh, the forum module went into core and then they got named out of core, but yet we're still adding like new modules into core, like big pipe, the new navigation module, and stuff like that. So the, uh, the question is like, well, how do you reconcile that? Like, how do you make sure we're not making that same mistake? And the answer is like, well, we want to have our cake and eat it too. So that's like Drupal CMS and Drupal Core. So Drupal Core like is going to continue on a very similar trajectory that it's been on. It is going to probably have some modules added to it as is necessary, like Project Browser and Automatic Updates. But all these extra stuff are going into Drupal CMS. And you're thinking to yourself, well, but then I just got to update Drupal CMS all this time and I don't even use these modules. You can yank them out. Like, what, if you download Drupal CMS, it's basically a series of recipes that pulls down these modules. And when you update those modules, you update those modules the way you do it right now. So Drupal CMS is basically the same thing as if you, besides the installation process, it's the same thing as if you just pulled down these modules and configured these modules for like the most common use case. So if you pull down Drupal CMS, you can totally do a composer remove path auto, yank out path auto if you don't feel that you need path auto. And that's gonna be completely fine. Uh, right here. Uh, how will views be changed in 
Drupal Starshot? How will views be changed with Drupal Starshot? I don't know that there's any 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 big plans to change views. There's going to be integrations with views, especially with things like Experience Builder. Views has like a little bit of cr some crusty old code. I was having some discussions about this earlier. So Views is going to continue to like iterate and fix a couple things, but that's not included under like the big Starshot umbrella. Go ahead. So you talked about um, targeting mid and small level projects is going to attract more developers. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, uh, the question is, is like, all right, we'll talk a little bit more about how these smaller projects are going to attract new developers, and you know, when new developers are like really interested in like things like React and like all this modern JavaScript ecosystem and stuff like that, what is that going to look like? So like, have you ever like has anyone here ever been to a, like a WordCamp? or anything like that for WordPress. Um, like, they're, they're pretty big, and they have, like, they have a lot of non-developers there. Like, if you, go to a, if you go to a standard Drupal camp, it's primarily developer-focused. If you go to a WordCamp, a lot of it's content-focused. And I love that about WordCamps. Like, it has a different amount of people in there. And the reason is, is because WordPress is easier to use. You know, if, if, if these people can get into Drupal and figure out Drupal, they, they will start learning more. When I, like, as a personal antidote, like, I got into Drupal around Drupal 5, and the, I love the fact that I could build a complex site with, like, SQL queries behind the scenes just by clicking around, because I don't, I don't know shit about SQL, you know? And um, so, like, that is what's going to get us. Now, like, the, React versus PHP. PHP is evolving, but there's still like the stigma of being PHP. But like, like I don't know. Have, have you ever like put together like a multi a complex like React and Node application? It's like this Rube Goldberg machine, you know. And an npm, you know, your your Node modules directory is like you know 13 megabytes, and you're like, what the hell is in there? And and you have things like left path, like there's issues in the React, and it's a pendulum that swings. Like, uh, uh, like React now is doing server-side rendering, you know, like, and, and you're like, dude, dude, we were doing that like back in like 1999 or something like that, you know, like we just called it websites, um, <laughs> you know? And um, it, like it's a pendulum, and, and I think a lot of that is gonna come down to marketing. And, and, there, and, and there's a lot of effort now going into marketing uh, from the Drupal Association. And, and we're going to market like some of the sexier websites that Drupal has made, like things like Tesla's website are, are, are based off of Drupal. And there's, and there's lots of other websites that are based off of Drupal. Like I can tell you like the government sites I work on are not terribly sexy, but like there are some cool sites out there that will like hopefully move that needle just a little bit. Uh, more questions? Uh, right back. Another one. Uh, what will this, what will uh, Starshot mean for like composer managed projects and configuration management? Because I struggle to understand how that you know you mentioned you know it being fully part of the Git workflow, but these are very big things right now. Mm -hmm. Nine and ten. So, I don't know so uh, the question is, uh, how does um, how 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 does it work with composer-based projects? And so, like, long story short, like, if you do your updates, your automatic updates, it updates those composer that composer log file. If you do your update, if you pull down your uh, a, a new project through Project Browser, it updates your composer JSON and composer log file. And then you can still you do your your command line composer if you like, or vice versa. Uh, more questions? If it's targeted towards non-developers. Yeah. Stuff. How, that's not an easy thing for a non-developer to figure out. Yeah. So you just keep it behind the, under the covers? Yeah, that's exactly it. So uh, the question is, like, well, all these APIs integrate with good workflows, so well, these are very developer-centric. So um, you don't have to use those. Like, you know, like, I, I manage my buddy's lawn care website, you know, because, like, that's how I roll. Like, he has, uh, 
he has a great website called themasterslawncare.com, and it's, it's on Drupal 10. And um, you know, right now I have to do all the updates, but like in the future, we'll be able to update it ourselves. And like to tell you the truth, like I don't give a crap if everything's in config for that website. <laughs> I don't, I don't like I do backups like every day. If we have to delete a blog post, you can just copy and paste it back, you know, or something like that. And, and you don't have to use those APIs to integrate them with good workflows. But if you're like a larger site, like the ones that I work on, the ones that you work on, it's gonna be useful. Uh, anything else? I don't see any other hands, so I'd like to, yeah, thank you everybody. Um, <laughs>